Global Machine Learning uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, today, it is our great honor to have uh, Professor Adam Smith uh, from Boston University to, to be with us and share with us uh, his, uh, his, his recent work. Um, Adam uh, um, uh, was a professor uh, at the Penn State University from 2007 to 2017 before he moved to Boston University. And he's really the, um, uh, the, the leading figure in the, in the research area of, of cryptography and differential privacy uh, with applications uh, in, in machine learning and information theory and so on. And, and uh, uh, he obtained his PhD from MIT in 2004. And, has uh, visited the Weizmann Institute of Science, UCLA, and Boston University and Harvard as a uh, as, as postdoc and other visiting positions. Uh, he received a lot of pre prestigious uh, uh, awards, including the Presidential Early Career Award uh, from NSF in 2009, uh, um, a number of Test of Time awards from the premium conferences in cryptography, uh, and the uh, notably the 2017 Girdle Prize uh, for for his work uh, in inventing differential uh, differential differential privacy, and he's also a fellow of the ACM. Uh, it is really our great honor to 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 have you, Adam. Um, and uh, today he's going to tell us about uh, memorization in machine learning. Take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um... Yeah, I'll be. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to Yusheng. It's, I would have loved to be there in person. The logistics uh, didn't work out, unfortunately, but uh, hopefully in a, on a future visit, I'll make it. And um, yeah, I'm still glad to be here, uh, if only virtually. Uh, so I'll be speaking about when memorization is necessary for machine learning. And this is partly, this is based on a couple of papers uh, recent papers that are joint with subsets of Gavin Brown, who's a PhD student here at BU, uh, my colleague, Mark Bunn, as well as Vitaly Feldman and Kunal Talwar at Apple. Okay, so um, it's not news that machine learning models contain information about their training data. They have to in order to, you know, they have to use their input somehow to, to um, derive the structures that they, that they look for in, in, in making predictions. But what we show is that in, indeed that this the sort of, we, we look at it in a couple of papers at uh, trying to understand a, like a really principled in investigation of how this phenomenon of, of embedding information about individuals in the, in the parameters of a model uh, plays out and to what extent it's necessary. So what we, in, in one paper, I mean, in a paper that appeared at Stock last year, we argue that there are natural settings where in order for machine learning models to be successful, um, they must memorize nearly entire training examples. That is, they must encode nearly complete information about several of their training examples in the parameters of the model. And that is uh, true regardless of how the learning algorithm works, regardless of the, um, the training process. Okay, and, and in a, uh, with a, I'll explain what I mean by this over the course of the talk, but um, furthermore, this memorization happens even when many of the details uh, of, that are memorized are ultimately irrelevant to the task at hand. And in a, another work that's, that's unpublished, that's more recent, we, we show how a similar phenomenon, not, a, not, not the same, but a similar sort of set of ideas, allows us to show that um, for an, a number of natural models, one pass learning algorithms, so streaming algorithms that process one example at a time, um, require large memory, require a huge memory footprint for training. Uh, and that is, and, and they require that because of a memorization-like phenomenon. Okay, and I'll explain what I mean when I get there. Okay, but I'll, from the bulk of the talk will really focus on this first statement, and then at the end, I'll talk about this other um, implication of, uh, not exactly implication, but this sort of variation on the theme. All right, so um, so let's start by talking about what we mean by memorization. So first of all, uh, you know, there are lots of settings where some sort of memorization of information in a machine learning model is just explicit in the way we think about the model. So if we think about like a, a one nearest neighbor classification model, so that's a model that classifies a new point according to the label of the nearest point in the training data set. 
the description of the classifier is basically a description of the training data set. And so, you know, it's not sort of surprising that it contains encodes information about individual training points. Uh, but this can sometimes be a little more subtle, like in the case of support vector machines, but even there, it's sort of fairly explicit that the, uh, if you support vector machine is a particular optimization problem used to train linear classifiers. And um, the standard way of presenting the result of this optimization is in terms of a subset of data points called support vectors. Okay, but often memorization is an unintended side effect of learning. And a, a really striking example came in a paper a couple of years ago now, um, where uh, Car um, Nicholas Carlini and others showed that uh, GPT-2, which is a language, large language model, uh, has encoded in its parameters a bunch of explicit uh, substrings of its training data. And that even when these strings are like not really about language learning, like they contain, for example, exact addresses and things like that. And if you kind of poke and prod the model, you can get it to spit out these chunks of its training data, like, you know, some particular address. Okay. Uh, and in a case of uh, art, you know, preceding life or uh, life imitating art, there was a, a, a comic that came out around the same time in XKCD where, uh, you know, Randall Monroe imagines uh, smart compose being used by the police to, uh, to, you know, catch a bunch of revolutionaries. Okay, so we're interested in understanding, uh, as I said, a kind of more principled understanding of, of this type of phenomenon and understanding when it's necessary and when it's, it, uh, you know, when, when it can be avoided. Okay, so just to clarify what I mean by when I say memorization, um, I want to distinguish it from something that is also a subject of a lot of investigation recently, which is the phenomenon of, of interpolation or, or near perfect fitting of the training data. So classic theory tells us we shouldn't fit perfectly to the training data. We should choose models that are um, under parameterized so that, you know, because of Occam's razor, they will lead us to good generalization. Uh, so you may have seen a picture like this in your machine learning textbook if you took such a class where you shouldn't choose the red curve, you should choose the green curve because it'll generalize better. Okay. Uh, but actually, uh, you know, we, that's not the way people train models these days. And there are good reasons for that. Um, uh, you know, in particular, my collaborator Vitaly Feldman showed in a paper, recent paper, that there are lots of natural models where this sort of interpolation is really necessary for accurate learning. Okay, regardless of the structure of the algorithm. Um, and and uh, because of these sort of, roughly speaking, because of um, in, individual data points that might carry a lot of information about the problem at hand. So, um, so like I said, generally people have looked at uh, you know, memorization in the form of interpolation of, of like memorizing labels, but we're going to look at a much more extreme form of memorization, more like that GP22 example, where the entire text is, or the entire uh, description of a training example is memorized in the parameters of the model. Okay, so to explain what I mean by this, I'm going to first state a weak version of the main result, and then uh, a stronger version that, that I that I claim is more meaningful. Okay. So here's the, the first version. So the first version says, uh, we've got a, a data set. Um, let's assume it consists of N rows and each of them is drawn from some population. We'll just assume they're drawn, you know, without replacement from the, or sorry, with replacement from the population. I, I, um, they're each independent and identically distributed. Uh, each row consists of D binary features plus a label. Right, just a simple, some simple straightforward encoding. Okay, and it's not necessary for our results, but it might be helpful to think of the setting where this dimension is much larger than the number of examples at hand. Okay, so this data set is fed to, is fed to a learning algorithm that produces a classifier. And uh, we evaluate the classifier in the usual way. We take a fresh data point, fresh feature vector from the same population, we run the classifier on it and we see if it predict correctly predicts the label. So the error of the model is just the, um, the ex expectation over data sets and training uh, and test points of, the, um, of the, the probability that we get the, the wrong label. 
Ashmore. And the question we're interested in is what, uh, what information about the data set, about the data X must be encoded in the classifier in order for it to um, work, to, 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 for it to be successful. Okay, so at a rough level, the, the main statement is that there are natural tasks. I'll explain what they look like in a second. Um, so natural, of course, is in the eye of the beholder, but there are natural tasks such that every learning algorithm with sufficiently low error, let's say within some 10% you know, of the optimal error, um, satisfies the following guarantee. The mutual information between the data and the model is at least some constant times the total amount of information in the data. Okay, so just, just to calibrate, so this, this notation here, um, if you're not familiar with it, this, this capital I means mutual information. So I won't, I won't define it formally for this talk, but it is just, uh, the, it's the standard Shannon notion of mutual information, if you've seen it before. It is some measure of how many bits of information about X are encoded in M, okay? So the mutual information is bounded above by N times D, which is, the the total amount of number of bits it takes to encode like the entire data set. Uh, so if you were to reveal like everything about the data set in the model, then it would, or like if you were just to include a copy of the data set in the model, the mutual information would be n times d. And what we're saying is every successful model has to encode around that much. So some, at least some constant times that. The constant is, you know, call it one tenth or something like that. Okay. So um, this isn't exactly the statement, and I'll explain why. But before I, I tell you the the real, the final, the actual statement, I'm just give you an example of the kind of problems we're talking about. So um, what we do is we look at, uh, you know, this is a theoretical work. So we want to choose a model that is a, like a, a problem setting that is sufficiently simple that we can you know, prove things about it and understand exactly what's going on but that somehow abstracts away the kinds of problems people solve in real life. So uh, the problem, we actually consider a couple of problems. This, the, this one, it, it feels like a geometric clustering problem. It's a very simple one. The um, data consists of a bunch of clusters and it, within each cluster, what, each, each group of data points is what I'll call a hypercube cluster. So this consists of um, within the cluster, there's a set of bits that are fixed. Okay, not very many. So there's, there's a sparse set of positions that are the same for all the vectors in the cluster. And the remain, within the cluster, the remaining bits are just filled in at random, uniformly at random. And then the label for, the label for uh, vectors in the cluster is the, like, the identity of the cluster. So the label for within each cluster, there's a separate label. And so the prediction task is to figure out which cluster a new data point came from. So what's going on is that like, you know, in this setting points from the same cluster, uh, they're a little closer together than, uh, than they would be if they were just uniformly random vectors because they share a certain number of positions that are always the same. Um, so the learning task is to identify which cluster generated a particular example. And notice that if I have lots of examples from the same cluster, it's going to be very easy for me to figure out which positions are shared. So within the cluster, I could just look within my training data. If I've got lots of examples from a particular cluster, I can just look for positions that are the same in all those examples, and those are going to be the fixed positions. Okay, so um, once I see lots of examples from a cluster, I can come up with a very compact description of that cluster. On the other hand, if I only have a couple of examples, like maybe just one example from a cluster, then it's hard for me to know which um, which points matter and which ones don't. And uh, as a result, it's hard for me to know what, it's hard, I can't really, or it's not obvious how I could construct a small uh, model of what's going on in this cluster. And what we'll see is that in, in, indeed that's, that's the case, you can't, but nevertheless, in order to do a good prediction job overall, there are gonna be many clusters with not too many with only a few examples. And in order to do well overall, I need to like remember everything about th those examples. And I'll explain a bit in a bit more detail what I mean by that. Okay, but the, the, the flavor is, to, is of, of a sort of a geometric problem where I'm trying to find uh, my training data, you know, within each cluster there are shared, there are positions that are shared, values that are, and uh, features that are shared. 
And now I want to figure out which cluster a point came from. OK, so this is the slide I had before, which says here was the main result. Um, but as I said, this isn't exactly what's going on. And the, pro the problem is that uh, in order to make this work, I need to somehow uh, sort of in order to say that the algorithm has to look at the data set X, uh, I need to somehow say that it doesn't already know what the distribution, the distribution from which the data were drawn was. So I need to somehow encode some sort of uncertainty, uncertainty about the distribution. Okay, so here's what we're actually, the way we're going to do this. We're going to think of the, um, the population from which the data are drawn as itself randomly distributed. So it's going to come from some uh, distribution over examples, over, over problems, or over a distribution over distribution. So there's this kind of meta distribution Q, and I'm going to sample a population from Q, and then the data will come from the population. Uh, and a priori, the algorithm knows Q, but it doesn't know the exact population it's dealing with, the exact data distribution. Okay, and now the result is there's a natural task, so a natural, reasonably natural Q, such that for every learning algorithm that does roughly within a constant of, op within like some, you know, small amount, gets roughly close to the optimal performance, um, the mutual information between the data and the model is high, even conditioned on a full description of the population. Okay. All right. So here um, we've got little p, a problem instance. That's a distribution on labeled examples. Big P is itself is actually now a random variable. So that's um, a sort of a meta distribution on the problems that the, on the instances that the uh, learning algorithm might have to solve. And now uh, the, the optimum to which we're comparing the algorithm's performance is just the best possible average error for populations drawn from this Q. Okay. So what does this um, statement say? It says that in order to perform well in this setting, the a, a learning algorithm has to encode information about its, its data, even though that information is ultimately irrelevant to the to the prediction task, because all the information about the prediction task is contained in uh, the population P. Okay, so everything you need to know to make predictions is sort of contained in the population, but because you, you, know, you, you only can access the population through the data, what we argue is that you have to store information about the data that's actually not about the population. So even after you condition on the population, there's still a lot of information between the model and the data. Okay, and as Yusheng uh, mentioned in the chat, I'm happy to take questions during the talk if people wanna put questions in the Q&A or raise their hands or unmute themselves or whatever, that's fine. Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a quick clarification. Yeah. Here. What, I, I didn't get what the difference is between little p and uh, big p. Okay, so think of little p as, um, a population in which we want to make predictions. Okay, so it's a distribution on labeled examples, and we want to find a classifier that does well on that on fresh examples from that population. Now, if the if the learning algorithm knew the population ahead of time, it could just ignore its data. Mm -hmm. So what we want to say is like, well, we want to kind of say that look, the the learning algorithm is uncertain, has to work, you know, is doesn't isn't all told the, um, the population ahead of time. So what we actually, what, the way we do that is we say, well, let's, we'll, we'll just give an explicit distribution on populations such that if you wanna do well on average over that population, over those populations, then uh, you need to encode lots of information about your data. So, and, so, so X, uh, X is the data, X to draw an IID from the big P, right? And, X and is drawn IID from, yeah, from from P, that's right. From from so, little P or uh, a little bit the realized version of big P. Yeah, P, little P is just a realization. Ah, okay, 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 okay. That that clarifies. And, and in terms of results, so this this says, says about the number of bits uh, that it encodes in the in the fitting model, but it doesn't actually say that uh, like how these bits are distributed somehow. So so it, it does not imply that any individual data point as fully like is is like that's maybe... right we'll we'll get there actually I've got okay oh uh, uh, that's a good point so this just says 
overall about i've got lots of information about the data it doesn't say that any single data point is in, entirely encoded okay. it just says like if i pick a typical data point uh, i've got a constant fraction of the information about that data point in the data in the model all right more questions are welcome okay so but what I, I did promise that we'd talk about memorizing whole examples. So here's what I mean by that. So actually we can strengthen this result a little further. And uh, what we can actually say is for the problems we consider, there exists a special subset of every data set. And we'll call these singletons. And I'll explain what that means in a little bit. Um, but what we show is that for, uh, you know, there's a, for this, these problems we consider, Every data set has this special subset of rows S, such that first of all, S is large. Okay, so S contains a constant fraction of the records in the data set. And furthermore, for every algorithm that gets within some small constant of the optimal error, the mutual information, not just about X, but actually about S, okay, in the model is at least um, D times the size of S times some fudge factor, which is close to one, okay? And so the point here is that uh, this, this is like all, the D times S is all the, all the information about examples in S, okay? So, here, what we're saying is that, you know, the first condition says there are a lot of these singletons, and the second condition says we store everything about those singletons in the model up to a fudge factor. So there's this one minus something which goes to zero if, as the accuracy uh, gets higher. Okay. So what is this saying? It's saying that like the, um, these special examples, they're, they're essentially entirely encoded in the model, or they have to be for the model to perform well. Now, um, we don't, we're not able to prove this for some, for all of the problems we consider. For some of the problems, it, for all of the problems we consider, we conjecture this to be true. Um, we're only able to prove it for some of them, but uh, I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Okay, so anyway, sorry, this was the, uh, this is the, the main theorem statement. Uh, and re so re really what this is saying is that, again, there are problems where in order for a classifier to do well, it must encode like full, essentially complete information about some of its uh, example, many of its training examples in the like description of the model. So M here is like, think of it as the parameters of a neural net. Okay, or whatever, whatever zip file you, you download if you want to access GPT-2. Uh, I, I have another quick question. This this uh, OPT is this a population level optimal or the data set level optimal? It is um, it is the uh, optimum for the meta population. So we're not actually you don't have to do as well as possible on P. You just have to do you have to be good on average for uh, problems drawn from Q. I see. I see. So it's actually a weaker requirement than either of the things you said. But, you know, roughly speaking, it's a, it's a population. So we're, our, the only measure of error we look at is population level error, like, like uh, the error at predict, making predictions on unseen examples. Right, right, cool. So this is like base error. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So op, OptumND D is the average over populations from Q average error of the Bayes optimal predictor. Yeah, yeah Eric Goddard actually had, has, a, has a question. Yeah, I tried to promote him to, to a panelist, but I, I wasn't successful. Laura, could you- Let me see if I can, uh, how is C quantified? Um, yeah, good question. So let's see, there's this, this C over here, right? This C, uh, C is a, an absolute constant in this, con you know, for sufficiently large N and D, there exists, there exists an absolute C. Okay, so like there exists a C, 
such that you know for all n and d sufficiently large. So we should think of c like a small. Like so think of c is like like small. twenty percent. Yeah, point two. Oh, it's a fixed, but then it affects. So the other things are some function of C or no? Oh, no, I guess C is fixed. So uh, I mean, it shows up somewhere in here. I mean, I guess you want C like as small as possible, I guess, right? Well, it's more meaningful. To, uh, I mean, more interesting when C is small, right? I guess. I guess it's actually more interesting when C is big, I think. Because it means you're encoding full information about more of your examples. Oh, okay, okay. But I... Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it's only true when C is like not so big, but uh, um, yeah, yeah. Actually, the the proof structure you can you can pretty much choose C to be, you know, almost anything. Uh, but it you know exactly how you set it up will show up in this this function f, which I'm not, which I'm like hiding. And yeah, and the dependency is like messy. Okay, looks like there are more questions in the Q&A. Let me see if I can display it. Um, all right, uh, so um, have you thought about this result in the context of mutual information generalization bounds? Seems this can apply mutual information generalization bounds will be vacuous for some tasks uh, or at the very least lower bounded by a non-vanishing quantity with respect to sample size. Okay, so Benjamin Bowman is asking about uh, mutual information generalization. Um, Yeah, so I think the, you know, one interpretation is that for these tasks, in order to, to get really good error, you need a lot of mutual information. That means the generalization bounds that are based on small mutual information will, you know, not tell you anything interesting. Um, so, yeah, maybe maybe we can come back to that at the end of the talk. I, I'm yeah, I'm not sure exactly what to say beyond that, but maybe there's more more to, to, to touch on. So and then, uh, but feel free, Benjamin, feel free to like follow up on that later. Alex Maber again, what kind of parameter regime have you showed to require memorization? Does it require having some clusters with very few samples? Absolutely, I'm gonna. So Alex, I'll, I'll get to that question in just a sec. So yeah, hold on to that one. Um, okay, so. All right, so what are, the, what are the problems we consider? Well, as I said, there's a mixture of many clusters and, and like the, me, the kind of meta problem is specified by saying, uh, you know, how are, how are the uh, sizes of the clusters gonna be distributed? Um, we consider a number of different um, possibilities for that as, as in the, the previous work of Feldman, but for this talk, it, it is fine for all our results to just use a uniform mixture. So just think about it that way. Um, but, but maybe to get at Alex's talk, there's going to be a, a mixture of many class, many of these clusters. So there'll be like roughly as many clusters as there are data points or on the same order. Um, okay. And then I have to tell you what's going on within each cluster. And so the way we'll do that is we'll say there's sort of a meta distribution that tell from which the per cluster problem is somehow, um, uh, sampled. And so within, e with, with, within each subpopulation, each cluster, I'll use the phrase subpopulation sometimes, within, within each subpopulation, there's a, a possibly separate problem. And those will be the, the kind of parameters within the subpopulation will be sampled independently from some distribution. And we consider roughly two structures for these, um, for these subpopulations. So one is the thing I mentioned before. Okay, so these are what I called hypercube clusters. So in that case, I've got um, a sparse set of positions. I'll, you know, I sub J. Uh, so J is the name of the cluster. So for each cluster has a set of positions that are fixed and a bunch, and, and they're fixed to some, let's say random bits. Uh, and then to generate a labeled example for that cluster, what I do is I fill in the remaining positions uniformly at random and I tag on a label, which is the name of the cluster. So the other type of uh, um, problem we consider is sort of something more, that, some, uh, some very uh, simple abstraction of a sequence prediction problem. 
So here within each cluster, there's a different like underlying secret sequence. We'll call it the reference string C sub J. Uh, it's just a string of bits. And now within each, um, to generate an example, I pick, I, I'm, I'm going to take a random prefix of this string C sub J and I'll flip a small number of the bits. So I, I just like uh, a, a delta fraction of the positions are replaced with random noise. And then the uh, label is the like the next position in the hidden string. So that's the label for this subsequence, this prefix. Uh, and then and and the the cluster index is sort of part of the description of the uh, of the example. Okay. So basically, what this uh, what this problem is asking me to do is to predict the next position in the sequence, but given a noisy prefix. And again, both of these problems have in common that if I see like lots of examples of a particular type, the problem becomes super easy. And I don't really need to, I mean, the, the stuff I end up storing is only about the population and not about like my data set. But if I'm only given, you know, one or a couple of examples of a particular type, then I need to store information that is, um, uh, that is somehow very specific to my example. I have to pretty much store the entire example, uh, even though I, you know, it's it's like a lot of that information is ultimately not useful to me. So um, yeah, so these are the two these are the two kinds of problems you consider. You can sort of like. Think of one as, a, again, a sort of stylized clustering problem and the other one a very stylized sequence prediction problem. Okay, so um, the way the, the basic idea for the, the way, the, way the, the thing that makes these lower bounds tick is that um, there are these, as I mentioned, these special examples that are the singletons and those are the data points that are all alone in their clusters, okay? And what we show is that, uh, you know, first of all, uh, we, you know, we set things up so that typical data set has lots of singletons. Uh, in order to be accurate on the population overall, you have to be accurate for like most of these singleton populations. You can't just ignore them. Because if you ignore them, you, you're losing out on a big fraction of the, of the overall distribution. Uh, on the other hand, and this is the, the so that, that step is actually very easy. It's just a very like simple, you know, um, probability argument. The more subtle point is that uh, if you want to be accurate on these singletons, then you need to kind of store near complete information about them. That's sort of what I mentioned earlier. And uh, on that point, we what we do is we prove um, to, to in order to argue that we give new sort of information complexity lower bounds on a, a for a two player communication game that's related to this classification problem. Okay, where the where Alice has a training data set and Bob has one example that he has to classify. Okay, so the, um, just to, to get to uh, you know Alex's question again, uh, you know in order to make this work, we need lots of singletons. So one thing that you you may you know depending on your, your background you may pick up on here is that the the problem description depends on the data like the problem I want to solve the problem that will be hard to solve depends on the amount of data I have. Okay, the hard uh, so there's a bit of a moving target phenomenon going on here where the we're going to sort of set the goalpost as a function of how much data the algorithm gets. Uh, and I'll talk about that more about that in a second, but, but basically I, I would claim that's actually a feature of the way a lot of modern machine learning problems work, where the more data we have and the richer our data sets get, the harder a, pro the, you know, the harder a, problem, a problem we set out to solve. So rather than just, you know, the more, one thing you can do when you have more data for, is just like keep on solving the same problem better and better and better. But that's actually not what people do. Once they get to a reasonably good ac high accuracy, they start, they, they move the goalpost and try to solve a harder problem, right? It's not enough to distinguish cats and dogs. You need to distinguish be beagles from German shepherds and sleeping dogs from running dogs and all that. Okay, so this, 
uh, this type of structure, I argue, I would argue, is is uh, not uncommon. Okay, uh, just just to be clear that you know our work exists in the sort of uh, within a, a nice framework of existing works. There's uh, this work of uh, Vitali Feldman's I mentioned earlier. There, um, there was some work on learners that leak little information, um, and in particular, some connections to lower bounds in the pack Bayes framework, if you know what that means. Um, and I'll just say that in, in some sense, the flavor of the results uh, is very similar. I mean, that is, it, they, those results can be translated into our setting, um, but they are kind of qualitatively much weaker. So they're showing that the amount of information that is memorized scales um, only a little faster than the number of data points that you have, uh, whereas it, we're able to show that you're getting, you know, um, theta of n times d, so not log d. Um, there's work on representation complexity, so that that is work on how small or large a model is needed to learn a particular type to solve a particular type of problem. Um, so those lower bounds have a again a very different flavor because they're they're more about showing that the just showing that the model has to be big in particular that you need to encode lots of bits about the problem uh, whereas we're showing that even after that whatever the model you write down even after i tell you the problem there's still a lot of information about the examples there to be found um, there is a connection to time space trade-offs for learning uh, that have been um, focus of a lot of result in the learning theory literature recently. I'll talk about those later, so I'll, I'm not going to say more. I'm not going to say uh, much about that right now. And of course, there are many other um, things there. So B Benjamin Bowman was asking earlier about uh, connections to uh, generalization bounds based on mutual information, things like that. There, there, there are lots of different ways where information and learning kind of come together, uh, and I, I'm not going to try to talk about all of them because I'd be here all day doing that. But um, but yeah, there are lots of nice connections, I think, between these various topics. Um, OK, Trinab is asking about, uh, there's a question in the Q&A about uh, the connection to privacy. And I'll talk about that in a second. So thank you for setting, my, setting up my next slide. Um, all right, so implications of our results. So, so first of all, uh, you know, one thing, uh, one consequence of these results is that you know these these very large models we train these days like you know GPT-3 for example is a language model that is enormous and it's not even that big there are even bigger variations on it now but uh, I guess when I first made this slide a year ago or so uh, it was um, uh, in the state of the art uh, so GPT-3 is is like you know you know barely fits on a hard drive um, so not only do these in, Giant models may be, they be unavoidable in many settings, but they may need to encode uh, individual inputs. If indeed what you want is to be able to like compete with the best model that uses this certain amount of data on which it was trained. Okay, um, and this gets to Trinab's question, uh, which is that there are new ways in the, the, the model. These results give new ways in which. Uh, differential in which privacy is hard. So differential privacy is one notion of uh, privacy for a machine learning algorithm. It basically implies that no single training point has a big effect on the distribution of outputs of the class of the learning algorithm. Um, so in particular, differentially private algorithms cannot, uh, they, they will not, will never leak a lot of information about, they will never have high mutual information with their data given the distribution. And so they can't solve these problems well. Um, we already knew lower bounds for differentially private learning. So in that sense, there's nothing new here. However, the kind of reason these lower bounds hold is in one sense, in, on one level, but you know, simpler than the reason why some of these previous lower bounds were uh, um, hold. But it, it's just also just very different. So it's, it's all about um, how, you know, the difficulty of, of doing well on these underrepresented subpopulations, okay? And of course, so what it says is basically, if you want an accurate uh, classifier, you need to do well on underrepresented subpopulations. And that means, uh, and those populations are necessarily at a higher risk for ex exposure. Um, 
and and as I said, the the sort of really the the the, the issue that so we argue that in this setting, men, the reason memorization comes up is because of there are these like regions of the data where we have an, like a little bit of data, but it's very scarce. And uh, as I said earlier, I would argue that this actually corresponds to the way people set up machine learning problems uh, quite often these days, where they try to push the complexity of the task they want to carry out uh, to the very limit of what can barely be accomplished with the amount of data they have. Okay, so that might mean like cutting up the data into smaller and smaller subpopulations or subproblems, or maybe increasing the complexity of the prediction task to predict, like, I don't know, labels or textual information and not just, you know, categorization, things like that. Uh, but the, the point is that, you know, we, the way people do machine learning these days, they don't just sort of fix the task and let the data and gather more and more and more data. They, they tailor the task to the data, to the amount of data they have. Um, finally, the, the model, the, the, there's some uh, implications of these results for um, our understanding of why, um, why these large overparameterized models uh, perform well. Okay, so there are, there's been a lot of research recently in trying to come up with sort of principled explanations for the performance, the good performance of these hugely overparameterized overparameterized neural networks. Okay, and to um, sim over, probably oversimplify a little bit, these explanations fall roughly into three categories. They can they talk about um, expressivity, so that's you know how just the the more the larger a model I have, the more parameters I have, the more functions I can represent. Um, a second angle is that optimization is easier in these large models because the more as you add parameters to the model, often what happens for, for many problems, uh, people have proven, that the optimization landscape somehow smooths out. And so the, the peaks and valleys kind of um, become more moderate. And so, you know, relatively simple optimization algorithms uh, tend, to, tend to be able to, you know, find good solutions more quickly. And, and then the third, the third argument is related to that, which is that these large models provide some sort of, the, the success of very simple algorithms like stochastic gradient descent, provide some sort of implicit regularization that uh, controls the generalization error of the models, even though you're fitting the data nearly perfectly. So our results suggest an, uh, a different factor, which is like qualitatively different, which is that these large models allow us to store information about our training data, whose usefulness is like not clear at training time because we don't have quite enough data to understand what we need to store and what we don't need to. Um, and, and, that, and it shows that this, this comes up when you have these very small subpopulations and, uh, and our results aren't really phrased this way, but I think, I think a similar phenomenon probably comes up uh, if you want models that can be used to adapt to like other other data distributions or other domains, the, what people call transfer learning and, and domain adaptation. Okay, so I think in general, you know, under, you know, understanding generalization of machine learning models is interesting and non-trivial, and I'm sure there are other, yet you know, further. Um, explanations to be added to this list and, and interactions between them that we don't really have a handle on. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's nice that we can add, add something to this list. Okay, so um, to uh, uh, just talk a, a, a little more um, about the lower bounds, as I said, that the, our strategy is to show that if if the algorithm is accurate on these singleton subpopulations, which it has to be to be accurate overall, uh, then it has to reveal near complete information about the singletons. And maybe I'll be brief about this because I want to get to the other uh, the other paper. I'm just looking at the time. Um, okay, I'll, I'll I'll say a little bit about it and then I'll I'll move on. So. Um, so let, let's look, for example, at what happens with this, the hypercube clustering problem. So in this case, we've got the, the following distribution. So um, 
what we've what we've done is we've you know within each subpopulation there's a certain number of fixed bits so each bit is in the fixed set with pro some probability rho so that it's about rho times d of the bits that are fixed um, but now let's look at what happens with singletons so with singletons let's say alice we've got two players alice and bob and alice only gets singletons so she gets k data points each of which is all alone in some cluster of this form. Okay. And now we're going to imagine what, you know, we're going to imagine a, a, a game between Alice and some other person, Bob. So Alice is going to mail, you know, a, send one message to Bob. We can think of this as the classifier. And Bob is going to get one example drawn from one of the populations that Alice had an example from. And Bob has to make a good prediction on that one example. Okay, so he gets a sample from some cluster capital J, which is random, uh, you know, drawn at random from one to K. Okay. So it turns out that if you sort of stare at these distributions for, for a little bit, you realize that we can kind of re-describe this game in a way that uh, feels quite different. It's not really about classification anymore, uh, and it's not really about fixed bits or anything like that. So here's an equivalent description of the game. Alice just gets k totally random d-bit strings. And Bob gets a vector y, which is a corrupted version of one of these strings. Okay, so what Bob gets is this, uh, this vector y, which is in which uh, it corresponds to a uh, corrupted version of one of the x's. And by corruption, I mean each, each bit has a y is equal to x with some equal to the corresponding bit of x with some probability and uniformly random with the remaining probability. Um, okay, and so now Bob's Bob's job again is to guess like which of Alice's vectors uh, he got a corrupted version of. And now there's a trivial strategy here, which is that Alice could just send all of her data to Bob. And it turns out that you know, the parameters are such that in that setting, Bob would, would succeed like 99% of the time at correctly guessing which uh, string his, ver his, his Y came from just by doing nearest neighbor. You could just pick the closest of the Xs and he'd be right 99% of the time. And what we argue is that there's no significantly better strategy for this game. That if you wanna send uh, significantly less than K times D bits of information, then uh, you know you're going to take take a big hit in terms of accuracy. Uh, or, or sorry, that's not exactly what we prove. That's what we conjecture. <laughs> what we prove is a little a little weaker than this. What we actually show, I apologize. Uh, what we actually show is that there's some constant. It turns out this is a constant such that if Bob succeeds with almost with just a bit less than the uh, optimal. Oh, sorry, if he succeeds, succeeds with near, near optimal uh, probability, probability, then he's sending like this constant times k times d bits. Okay, so that's the thing we can actually prove. Uh, and we conjecture that it's, it's tight. That, uh, sorry, we conjecture that, you, that, it's, that one can actually prove this, get like a lower bound of, uh, of one times k times d. Uh, but this is actually an, an open problem in our paper. So for the for the other sequence prediction problem, we can actually prove this this stronger statement down here of the flavor that's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but uh, for um, but for this uh, nearest neighbor problem, which I think is the more interesting of the two, uh, there's this interesting gap between what we can prove and what we think to be true. Uh, we ran some experiments that I'm going to skip over. They showed that you know the theorems are largely true, but I guess may maybe the interesting thing about the experiments is they show that at least for common training strategies, the, there are not only there's a lot of information encoded, but you can recover it efficiently, like in fact, you know, with a fast algorithm. Um, but I'll skip over that. So I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the second, uh, just for a few minutes about the second result, and then I'll conclude. So, um, so to explain what the second result is about, it, it helps to, uh, you know, have to understand that it's, a, it's about a, a different model of computation. So we're now, 
up till now, we were imagining like the data is handed to the learner all in one big tarball. And now the, and the learner runs, you know, runs whatever algorithm it wants to, comes up with a classifier. That's the, the model I had on the slide earlier. And now we're gonna consider a different uh, setup where the learner has more structure to it. So specifically the learner sees one example at a time and updates some relatively small memory. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about how big the memory has to be. Um, and then at the end of this process of, see, of looking at each example once, it produces a classifier. And again, the, the accuracy of the classifier is evaluated the same way we evaluated it before. So now what we're gonna look at is not how much information about the data is contained in the final classifier, because we're actually gonna look at settings where the final classifier is very small, but how big the intermediate memory states have to be. Okay, and that's because, you know, this is interesting, uh, partly just for very practical reasons. My, you know, a lot of large scale learning systems work in this streaming fashion. And the, the overall cost of the system is driven by how much time it takes to update the, the memory, but also the just the size and bits of the memory, like how big the memory footprint is. Because if, you know, for example, if you can fit, if, if the entire memory fits in cache, then, uh, you know, you can, the algorithm will operate much more quickly. All right, um, so our goal is to understand uh, how much space a learning algorithm uses as a function of a few key parameters. Okay, so one is the data dimension. So this is the same as before. Uh, this is the uh, number, the, the, you know, the number of bits it takes to represent an example. Uh, and the other is a parameter I'll call kappa, and that's just the size of, a, of the final model we produce. So the size of like a good model for this, for this problem. Okay, so just how many bits does it encode to, to take to encode a good classifier? Uh, and then there's the stream length, which is how much data we have. Okay, so it, what we show are, are uh, I, I claim, you know, reasonably natural problems in, in particular. Um, so for example, problems where you're le le learning a classifier, which is uh, just a, a thresholding of a sparse, uh, degree two polynomial, uh, for example, uh, where a non-trivial prediction requires an amount of memory that is um, equal to this uh, to some this parameter this quantity d times kappa um, times some some addition, additional factor of kappa over n. So just to explain a little what's going on here. So kappa over n, is, so it turns out in these examples, in these, in these problems that it, it, because the, a good classifier can be described using kappa bits, in principle, I can completely solve the problem if I'm given just kappa exam, arbitrary access to kappa examples or order of kappa examples. And so this, this kappa over n is, this factor tells us how much more than the minimal number of examples do I actually have to work with? Okay, so more data in this case makes the problem easier. Um, the memory, on the other hand, just to, uh, what we argue is that the, the sort of basic term in this, in this lower bound is d times k. So that's the amount of memory it takes to store these kappa examples that are sufficient to learn, uh, to learn if, if I weren't restricted in memory. Okay, so like pictorially what's going on is like, like every problem of this type exhibits a solution with uh, k with kappa examples and uh, memory kappa times d. So I just store all the examples. On the other hand, um, it, there's another sort of tri basically trivial strategy for problems of this type, which is that, uh, <clears throat> that you can use just kappa memory. You can just work with one uh, one classifier, one possible classifier at a time, and just try out all possible classifiers. And it turns out, you know, roughly speaking, you'll get uh, you'll get away with something like two to the, a stream length of about two to the kappa, but only kappa memory. So these two data point, these two points are achievable essentially for any problem of this type. Um, in a striking result, there's a, the striking line of work by, um, and the, the, maybe the flagship is this result, is this result of Ron Raz from 2018, 
uh, for learning parity, where he shows that for 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 this for for one problem, learning learning parity, which is kind of a an unusual problem in the sense that it's very natural theoretically, but maybe not super practically motivated. Um, <clears throat> these two trivial strategies are the best you can do. You can either get either you need kappa times d memory or two to the kappa examples, and you can't do any better. Okay, and there's a bunch of other follow-up results that extend this to other con other concept classes and other types of problems. Uh, I don't have time to discuss them all. Um, on the other hand, all the, these example, the, these results of this type, they are for these, these problems like parity that have this sort of algebraic flavor or other co more combinatorial ones um, that are really different from the kinds of problems people solve most of the time day to day. Okay. So, in terms of more practically motivated problems, there's this uh, beautiful result on linear regression by Sharon, Sidford, and Valiant. And they show this a lower bound of the kappa D. So it's sort of saying that the trivial, the trivial bound is tight, but only in a very narrow range of sample complexities. So they show that this is tight up to uh, a little more than kappa examples. And after that, the kind of complexity sort of falls off a cliff. And you get these online optimi on online convex optimization algorithms that actually perform quite well. So for linear regression, you can't can't do much better than that. So what we do is we show some some sort of different problems. See, th these are regression problems where the classifier is a sparse linear classifier, but in some implicit feature space. So, for example, uh, degree two uh, monomials. And uh, so those are just ands of pairs of bits. <coughs> and uh, what we show is that for these problems that you get, you can get like a, a reasonably strong lower bound. It still drops off with the, as the, the stream length increases. So it's not as qualitatively strong as the results for parity, but it, imply, it, it applies to problems that are much closer to the kind, like in particular problems that are solvable by variations on gradient descent. Okay, and so what I, I, I have some slides on this, but I don't really have time to talk about it. Um, the reason that these lower, the, the way we prove these lower bounds is via connection to memorization. So what we show is that um, as the algorithm executes, if I take like a, a, a typical memory state of the algorithm at some point during its execution, then it needs to contain a lot of information about many of the examples that came previously. Okay, and so um, even though the final model is very compact, the intermediate memory states have to be uh, quite big, much bigger than the size of any one example and much bigger than the size of the final model. Um, and you know, one really interesting question is if we can find natural problems that sort of for which the uh, the complexity can be shown to the space complexity can be shown to behave more like how parity behaves, or vice versa. Are there you know it's maybe it's possible that there are sort of families of learning algorithms that we haven't really explored yet that give us a more uh, that show that for you know for many natural problems maybe say those that are can be solved via gradient descent that um, in fact, there's a, there's a, a time-space trade-off where you can, you can trade off space for just lot, lot, you know, more data uh, in a very generic way. So it's true for the, the particular instances we look at that it is true that the, our bounds are tight, but there's no reason to think that's true in general, at least not yet. Okay, so I will uh, stop there. I had a, you know, a couple more things to say about it, but um, I, I think... Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm out of time. So just, you know, I think it, just in terms of where to take all this, <coughs> I think, you know, uh, understanding these types of phenomena for models that look more, even more like what, uh, what goes on in the real world. Like, so we consider these very simple models like sparse multi-class logistic regression or, or degree two polynomials. Um, also trying to understand the you know, connections between memorization and other phenomena like, like pack-based learning, which is still you know, an interesting um, place to look and, and various limited access data models is interesting to me. Um, and then another question is that the, the connection to running time, which I haven't really been talking about, but like there's, there is a sense that 
faster algorithms are a lot more constrained in how they process data. And so it's entirely possible that some of the uh, pathologies we encounter in uh, real life learning problems really come from the need to, to find really fast algorithms. And we don't really have a good handle on, on um, how that affects things. So with that, I will stop and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you very much, Adam, for the for the excellent talk on uh, a very interesting topic. Uh, so so uh, so so we, we have time for uh, Adam to address a few questions. And for those who are who have questions, please uh, raise your hand so we can uh, upgrade you into a panelist. So I'll get 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 things started by uh, asking a question. So so Adam, you talked uh, uh, um, a lot about lower bounds on how uh, in order for the machine learning models to learn, you have to memorize uh, um, almost all data points. And, and in particular, the, uh, the, like for, for us, the, the kind of uh, very sparse data point in the sense that the, it belongs to a cluster that are nearly singletons on the data set, mm -hmm. but not on the population. Um, and, and are there also upper bounds that you, 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 you thought about? For instance, uh, Trina asked a question about differential privacy. Like suppose, how, how large is the gap between the kind of protection that the differential privacy is giving you versus what is achievable like under this weaker, in some sense, notion of privacy um, in terms, terms of memory. Mm, yeah, yeah, I, I, okay. So, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, differentially private algorithms won't memorize, I mean, provably don't memorize. Uh, and so I think you're showing your question is, well, what if, what, if we, what if we just set like not memorizing as the standard, then what? Right, like maybe maybe we could do better than differentially private algorithms. I, I would. I'm not sure. I would. I, I don't know the answer, but I'm not sure I would encourage that as the way to go. Yeah, that that, that yeah, that wasn't wasn't actually what I asked. So, uh, so, okay. so if we if we think about the memorization problem, right? So we want yeah. our models to learn. We also due to various issues, we don't want our models to memorize, right? So in some sense, that you you've shown that there's a trade off. But in practice, uh, there are some part of the data set, data points, or maybe some kind of learnable concepts that can be represented more more compactly. But there are also data points that are isolated, uh, in which each one live in a little island that you have to memorize yeah. them. So, are there adaptive algorithms that, that actually learn the the part of um, uh, concepts that can be learned without memorization? Uh, and while while uh, like preventing uh, oh yeah, yeah so so yeah. and and my question is whether differential privacy it uh, and and algorithm ideas from differential privacy is the right way to go to achieve such adaptivity. Oh, I see. Yeah, I don't know the answer in general. It's a nice question. Um, for the examples we consider, uh, you could you could definitely find differentially private algorithms that would like do a good job on those subpopulations mm -hmm. where there's enough data. Uh, whether or not that's the best way to do it, I'm, I, you know, I, off the top of my head, I don't know. It's a, it's a good question. Um, but in any case, whatever I, whatever I could say about it would be very specific to the like mm -hmm. the exact the distribution that we consider right. as opposed to sort of some more general statement. Um, in what is true in general is if, if, if like memorization in the final model is your concern, then it seems you like, if you kind of fix the problem and the distribution and let N go to infinity, you can always eventually solve the problem with no memorization. That is, you can always eventually get enough data to just learn a complete description of the data distribution of the distribution and then your mm -hmm. whatever you say is sort of like not specific to your sample but that requires like a lot of data you know like exponential l and d kind of data right uh and so i think what's possible is that for much more modest amounts of data you can still get like interesting restatements um about like learning things that are only true for the distribution that's basically what different tree private algorithms do but maybe there are other classes that make sense here yeah I don't, i'm not sure the, the real answer to your question cool um 
Uh, I'm happy to take more questions. I, I know I know people. It's it's past time, and the the number of attendees is kind of dipping as as people move on to other meetings and things, and that's of course uh, fine. But I'm happy to take more questions. If people yeah, uh, I have another another question re regarding the second uh, uh, part of the talk. Uh, so so <laughs> so you moved from a, a standard learning setting to a streaming learning setting. But, but I thought the, the first set of results already implied uh, the need for memorization, which um, like in some sense says the memory uh, requirement uh, is, is already lower bounded. So what was new in this streaming Yeah, setting? there's no direct implication between the two. So we had to like write new proofs um, and, and, and like, and very different ones. Like they're not, they're not the same. <laughs> um, so why is that is because uh, there's, so in our setting, there's like plenty of data to learn a model which is basically independent of the of the sample, and so you really don't you don't need you don't need to memorize in the final at all in the final output. Okay, and you in fact you have way more data than you need even for that. So what or at least I mean it depends where you are on this sort of horizontal axis here, but like once you're out you know like out here somewhere. You've got way more data than you need to um, to train without memorizing. So really what we look at are intermediate states in the training process. And those intermediate states don't have to be classifiers, right? So like if you insisted that that an, an, a, the, the state somewhere in the middle be uh, itself a good classifier, then maybe you could say something more like what, what we see, you know, see, use the statements. But like there's... But we d but there's no reason to to think that streaming algorithms have to have that structure and and, and the and the kind of bonds is on the uh, on the memory uh, uh, on the storage rather than uh, like rather than the amount of information that you have to update after every every every, every iteration. Right? So uh, you, you yeah, keep the, adding to this and increasing the memory and that that's that's allowed. Yeah, the, the, I mean the thing we look at is is some sort of notion of actually of information. It's an information complexity bound. Um, so it looks at some sort of average over kind of, you know, memory, oops, um, memory state. So time, like there's some time T and then we'll look at some other earlier step I and we'll look at how much mem how much information the memory state at time T has about the data at time I. Uh, even condition, and then we'll condition on the problem description as, as, a, as we did before, and also the kind of memory at the, the previous time step. Oh, and so uh, this is the thing we're actually lower bounding. It's like this information okay. complexity measure. It's kind of a funny measure. And it, uh, the reason we need to work with it is because it allows us to kind of, okay, it's technical, maybe, maybe not that interesting at this stage. Um, <clears throat> But so it's it, it implies a space lower bound, but it's it's really quite different from that. It's a, it's an information bound, um, and I'll mention that you know that this, working with this information complexity allows us to like talk about reasonably, as I said, reasonably natural problems. Um, on the other hand, there's no way using that type of argument that you could prove a lower bound like the lower bound for parity. I see. So I see. Arguments of the form we consider necessarily have this like one over n. Right. Argument. Right. I see. Uh, so I think I think it's really interesting what like what goes on in these sort of right streaming systems and and um, I you know I I conjecture that if one could ask these questions say rather than for like arbitrary algorithms for like first order algorithms or algorithms that use the data in a very specific way to optimize. Um, by by restricting the class of algorithms you consider, one you, you could prove stronger statements, presumably. But also, I think you'd learn something about you know how optim you know what types of optimization algorithms can succeed in these sort of constrained settings. Yeah, very 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 interesting. Yeah, I have one one last question. So you you've shown this very interesting slide related to to uh, how uh, the these set of new results imply on. Uh, over parameterization and understanding uh, um, like how these modern approaches of a large model paradigm uh, could have worked. Um, 
like is is a is, is it correct to to I I guess uh, conclude with a take home message that uh, um you you this your result implies that for a set of natural problems uh, over parameterization and using large models that memorizes uh, almost everything is necessary like so that that somehow provides a, um, a justification to those cases when we really want to learn the tail of the distributions um like in, in in reality and and no compact model would have worked yeah that's that's possible that like one one way to think about it is if you want to learn the 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 way out in the tail the long tail uh then you're going to have to memorize uh or if you want to if you want your model to be adaptable to new domains that may well also be true although that's not what our results say um yeah, the, the new domain thing is quite interesting. I, I would really love to see it formalize this. And I, I, so another thing that we can say, so what, like if I look at these, actually the streaming lower bounds, in fact, they, they have like sort of explicitly this flavor where there's sort of a natural parameter, amb, like ambient parameter space for the problem, which is, um, so so like just to explain the kind of problems we're looking at. So there, there's, there's, sparse linear classifiers, but in some implicit feature space that's like bigger, you know, bigger than the size of one of, of the, bigger than the dimension of the data. Okay. So there's sort of some ambient parameter space that where it's natural to run say gradient descent or multiplicative weights or something. And what our lower bounds say is that somewhere along the way and during training, you have to be working with a memory size that scales with that, the dimension of the ambient space rather than the mm. size of the final model you produce. So what this, you know, the phenomenon that this sheds light on is the kind of the way people train these sparse neural networks where they start with a huge model with lots right, and lots of parameters right. and then they train for a long time. And then once they've sort of gotten close to an optimum, they start throwing the stuff out. Right, right, right. So right. this says like, okay, here's a very, there's very simple problems where you pretty much have to do that. Like there's just no other way to do it, which I, I think is kind of fun. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting observation. Yeah. Okay. So there was a. We have time um, for one last question. So we'll, yeah, somebody had uh, their hand up for a second. Yeah, Winda, could you, could you unmute yourself and ask? Uh, yeah. So I want to describe a situation. So uh, in the sorry. Uh, so uh, during the training time and the inference time, uh, assuming you have a data distribution already at the training time uh, with the X, and you have a sample. Uh, let's assume it's XI. And it's like the similar example you described in the lecture where you have a minor perturbation on the uh, on the XI, for example. Uh, but, but in this time, it's occurring in the inference time. Well, I have this really realistic example, DI could be uh, obtained through a minor perturbation um, of XI, and which will have a very different label in this case. So, uh, I, I call this phenomenon like a knowledge complex going between training and uh, inference. So is there a way that you can think of that we can try to regularize the memorization in the process so it will not, um, it can handle this knowledge complex between training and inference? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure I have anything like really <laughs> interesting to say about it, but let me see if I can uh, take a bash at it. So certainly in the examples we give, the learning algorithm, the data distributions are such that even if the learning algorithm has a very like weak guess of what the right label is, it should just guess it. Mm -hmm. Right, because we're you know we're evaluating the algorithm based on misclassification error, not confidence. Um, so, in some sense, I think I'm not sure, but it, it seems to me that what you know the thing you're kind of talking about is one where, like, if indeed examples that are very similar to XI are going to have different labels with high probability or something like that, maybe I should ignore XI or at least not not be over is you know I, I sort of interpret this as like a confidence thing like i should 
my model should somehow be um, cautious in making predictions for examples where it, it like isn't so sure what's going on. Yeah. But like you seem to be trying to get at something different. And, and so I'm not sure I've really answered your question. Uh, it's more like, uh, so uh, maybe maybe some data would change through the time. For example, currently the US president maybe is uh, Biden, right? Then, then maybe a few uh, years later, the president changed, right? Uh, so I, I wouldn't want the model to memorize too much about certain words in the current current situation. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's certainly an interesting question. I mean, it's, it's definitely like way outside the modeling framework we, we were using, right? Where there's just like one population and you know, you get IID samples and so, you know, like certainly the kind of thing you're talking about is, is quite different. Yeah, in, in those cases, perhaps like you want your model to somehow forget uh, and adaptively decide like how much uh, a memory to keep uh, about the past. Right. Yeah. yeah, but certainly like what we were after were, we're looking like what's the simplest possible setting where we can observe, we can, you know, look at some phenomenon and argue that it, it like is necessary, you know, and like really understand it. Um, and I think once you've done that, it then opens the door to do much more subtle things and sort of look at like, okay, maybe it's, it's more complicated than that. And like, maybe, you know, maybe robust models don't have to memorize, you know, I don't know, like maybe the model somehow the, or something like that. Like I, you know, it's not that I have a, a great answer. Um, but what got, what got me thinking about this problem in the first place was like these empirical findings where they're, you know, you, you train these huge language models, especially, but also image models. And then you, you know, you poke and prod and you realize they basically got like the things they were trained on, like written in their parameters. And, I, you know, that, you know, it started, this paper started as a conversation between Vitaly Feldman and myself, where we were like, well, you know, maybe, maybe this has to happen sometimes. Right? Mm. Um, and then it took, took a while to actually, you know, turn that into a paper, but you know, that certainly the idea was pretty, was, was simple and was really driven by these empirical phenomena. Right, right. And, and you are making the, the condition weaker and weaker and making such constructions more and more uh, closer to the natural, uh, natural occurring examples, right? So suppose one can show that even if the data sits in a very low dimensional manifold embedded in this uh, extremely high dimensional observation space and such phenomena is still required and, and, and that would be, um, yeah, even, even, oh, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. Certainly the examples we have don't have that flavor. Like for right. the, very explicitly, like we kind of set it up so dimension reduction is not going to work right, very well. Right, right. But cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's thank Adam again for this excellent uh, distinguished lecture. And well, we hope to, to thank see you. you for the, thank you to the people who stuck around. I, you know, I think, uh, you know, still like, you know, a hearty bunch of sort of 15 people or so who, who stuck around. So thank you. Um, and uh, um, as I said, I'm, uh, thanks again for inviting me, Yushang. I'm sorry I wasn't able to make it there in person. Um, yeah, save it for the next it's time. It's going to be pouring rain here tonight, so I, I, don't worry, I'll regret it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> thanks All right, again. Adam. <laughs> yeah, thanks.